the first point I wanted to raise is the ability to have engineering change. So here, for example, against the list of release products, I can see engineering details. Engineering details gives me things like an engineering status against this part. So is it in initial design? Is it in manufacturing? Is it in prototype, etc.? All of which have different controls against them to say what can be done. So for example, a product that is in prototype, you may want to be able to do manufacturing to, to do production trials for that, for example, but you wouldn't necessarily want to sell it at that point. So the status through the engineering status is a, a very important one. You also got things like engineering attribute search, and here we start to come to a, a couple of critical features, which are things like engineering change request and engineering change orders, um, which I'll go on to next. So, from an engineering change request perspective, you can raise an engineering change request or an ECR from many different places in the system. This one has actually been from a sales order or a quotation rather, um, but it could be from lots of areas. So you could raise an ECR from Manufacturing, for example, as you start to put the bits together, you find they don't quite fit, there needs to be an engineering change request raised at that stage. It may be from service engineers that are going out on site looking at the, the actual problems that are being incurred. They may change it and raise a, an engineering change request that needs to be actioned, etc. So we can put those sort of things and relate them to lots of different areas in the system. You'll also see here you have things like a status to this engineering change request. It has a priority, a severity, an impact to it. And eventually, if that change request becomes approved, that will then become a change order. Uh, you'll see also in this screen sample is that you have the yellow bar at the top here. This indicates that a workflow action is actually necessary. Um, and I, once I'm happy that I've put all the details for this engineering change request, I can submit this to approval so people can start to actually get involved, look at the content to it. Uh, and, and approve it or, or not approve it if that's the case. Now once it is approved, you have the concept of the engineering change order that's generated at that point. Now the, the engineering change order of course is uh, just the natural follow-on from the change request and I can go back to the change request at any point if I want to. Um, but importantly what I can start to see in here is I'm starting to look at the impacts of the change. So I can have many different products that are part of this engineering change request for example. I can look at the details of those. I can see the attributes that might be changing as well. So if this particular change is going to change an attribute of the product in a certain way, then I can see the attributes that are going to change. Also any documents that may change, so specifications, CAD drawings, uh, specification sheets and so on, they're all documents that may need to get amended uh, as a result of this engineering change. And of course we may also do, depending on the nature of change, change the bill of materials. Uh, and this all starts to fit around the categorization for, for this and the priority of it to say what type of change is this, what level does it have to go through. So for example a cosmetic engineering change, you may change the bill of materials of course, a form, fit and function one very much would and that may also move version numbers of the product along as well uh, and those can all be controlled within this part of the system. One of the key features about engineering change orders is to look at the dependencies and that's this area here. So with this part we can look at the dependencies for this particular change. So for example, we may be going from a version A of a product to a version B of this engineering change. So what the dependencies will allow us to do is actually scan to find any version A products that are out there. Do we have a version A product that's sitting on the shelf? Do we have a version A product that is currently in manufacturing? Have we got some sales orders for version A? All of these are dependencies that we're about to impact because we are going to a version B of the product. So it will actually do a search for those, and more than that, it will also allow us to do what's called process those dependencies. So once it's actually come back with a list of all of the sales orders, for example, for version A, I can then say update those to version B. If it finds any production orders, I can say put that production order on hold and don't allow it to go any further. Or I can say if it's not been started yet, change it from version A to version B, etc. So it's given me a lot of power in actually looking at the impact of the engineering change and then actually making it a lot easier to actually action those changes that I need to make uh, through that part of the system. Once we're happy with it, we can check against readiness control. So if this is a new product, for example, that we are introducing, um, we can have a readiness control checklist where you can see a list of ticks and crosses to say what has been done and what hasn't been done. And these can be checks that are identified by the system for example, so have we got the cost price set up, or it could be a manual checklist that we want to go through. So again, you're in complete control of that to say 
define the checklist to make sure that when a product is released into a company that it has all the right information to actually allow you to start using that properly within the ERP environment. Um, I mentioned attributes earlier on uh, and I said they could be very important and what you'll see here is that we have the ability to actually search for engineering attributes. So in this particular example, while we're actually raising a quotation on the system, I may be looking for a particular part that we've provided in the past, for example. So I might want to look for where the color range is a certain profile or where the dimensions are a certain categorization or the energy consumption, etc. So any of the different attributes that you define, you can use for searching. And here we're using searching, as, as I mentioned, uh, against a, a quotation as well. Now, coming back to the actual live system, um, what I just wanted to go into here is I've actually talked quite a bit about workflow and using actual processes there to actually action an event. So workflow really is putting in place a business practice uh, and taking it through electronically. So where there would typically be sheets of paper that actually go around the business, we can actually manage those uh, electronically on the system. So a great example of that might be things like travel and expenses, for example not necessarily related to production, but it's, it's an area of the system where we can actually activate workflow. And I'm choosing this one because really I've got quite, a, quite an in-depth workflow view to actually show you. So I can see that in this case we have something called a dispute workflow. And if I go to edit that workflow, uh, that's going to bring back a new screen, which is essentially a, a drag and drop board where we can actually move the content about and I can see the different stages of workflow that are taking place here. So for a dispute we're actually going through several different stages before we actually get to a conditional decision point. If I look at any of these steps I can look at the properties against it. So in here we can start to put the rules about what we actually want to message, what we actually want to say as part of this task that's being assigned to somebody, who it needs to get assigned to, which can be to particular roles within the business or it can be specific users if you want to. But very importantly, we can also put a time limit on this task as well. So how long is it going to take to complete? How long do we want to allow them to, to, to have this uh, task open? I can specify the number of days. It's a little bit mean here. We're only allowing one day, uh, but you can see the sort of thing we can do. If it's not completed within one day, I can then actually define an escalation path. So this is actually escalating up through levels of management, uh, essentially at this point, to say who needs to get involved. I can also enable automatic actions. So an automatic action would be uh, that we want a rule that says if this condition is met, then bypass this stage, for example. That's quite a good one for where there might be approval limits, for example. If on a purchase requisition, I'm raising the requisition and the amount of that that requisition is less than or equal to my spending limit, then I don't need to get approval involved. I've already got authority to do so, and so on. So it's, this area is really where we're building up those rules. Um, and you'll see here for the conditional decision, there's a, a true branch and there is a false branch. Again, if I right click and look at the properties here, what we're doing is we're saying, if this dispute status is accepted, and that statement is true, then we are actually going down this branch if it's false, then we've got extra steps that we need to go through. So I can put as many parallel activities, decision points uh, that get involved here as necessary to define accurately my business process and how I actually want that to be managed uh, in the system. So that's a classic case of using that sort of thing um, for things like engineering change, new product approvals, etc. Uh, throughout the entire system.